Shalom Aleichem, everybody. Welcome back to the Yibbe Nebet Midrash. Welcome home to Torah. A warm welcome. We are in Parsha Balak. That is found in Numbers chapter 22. We're actually going to deal with what we'll call uh, verse 2. Um, I'm not even on the right page. Here we go. Just as a uh, general announcement that I usually make, and I'll, I might as well, we encourage you to follow along in the Hebrew. So there are Hebrew sheets available on the webpage. There's a link below. Um, we do learn. We actually do learn Hebrew along the way, and we encourage you to as well. <clears throat> so actually, we also use the clear car uh, as the basis uh, for our discussion. And here we go. So it says over there who Balak is. And he's the son of Tzipor. We don't realize he's the king of, of Moab until verse, the end of verse 4. But he is the one who saw all that Israel had done to the Amorite, as the verse said, Ve'yar Balak ben Tzipor et kol asher also Yisrael le'emuri. I think we should become familiar with these first three verses um, in order to, um, you know, just as a basis for the discuss good discussion. Uh, it's very necessary. So in verse 3, it says, Moab became very frightened of the people um, because it was numerous. <clears throat> so that's the first part of the verse. V'yagar Moab mipnei ha'am ma'od ki ravhu. And then the verse continues to tell us that Moab was disgusted in the face of the children of Israel. And you'll understand why I really don't like that translation. Disgusted, but we'll, we'll, we will delve into all these issues. So it says in Hebrew, V'yakatz Moab mipnei b'nei Israel." And then finally, verse 4, which is the longest verse that we're going to deal with. Moab said to the elders of Midian, V'yomer Moab el ziknei Midian, he says, now the congregation will lick up our entire surroundings. And then it continues and says, as an ox licks up the greenery of the field. And then it tells us that Balak was the king of, um, of Moab at that time. Balak ben Tzipur Melech Lemoav Ba'esahi. Okay, now what we should in tune, right, intuit that there's something very unusual going on here. The first thing you'll notice is there are four descriptions of Israel. Very unusual. In, in, in these just handful of verses, or less than a handful of verses, you have the name Israel that Balak saw what Israel had done to the Amorites. The second thing is that the people, the, the, the masses of Moab, became terrified of the people. So Israel is now called the people, uh, for they were very numerous. And then Moab became disgusted because of the children of Israel. So we have Israel, then we have Ha'am, the people, and then we have the children of Israel. And they were disgusted because of that. And then they called upon or they approached the elders of Midian in for what purpose? To get them to be allies, right? They knew they were up against this, looked like a formidable army or a, a massive amount of a people in the desert. And they call us a kahal. Now it's called now this assembly. That's the description that the Jewish people are called, an assembly that will eat up everything around them as the ox eats up the grass of the green of the field. Okay, now the very first thing, just take a look at Rashi. What did Balak see? All you have to go is back to the very end of last week's Parsha, pretty much, to see that all what Israel had done to the Amorites. What, what does Rashi say? These two kings, meaning Sichon and Og. These two kings whom we relied upon, I guess is like either you know, a first defense or some kind of barrier. If these two kings, happen to be giants, could not resist these people, then there's no way we can either. And therefore, Rashi says, Moab became terrified. That's Rashi. And as I mentioned, the clear car, the very first thing he says is, what's going on here? 
I thought what happened was when the Jews left Egypt, right, the sea split, all of the world knew what was going on. Who didn't know what was going on as it was happening, pretty much? I mean, even in the, in the, in the, when the sea split, if I was in, I don't know, Hong Kong or Beijing or New Zealand, wherever I could have been, if I had a cup in my hand, the cup would have split, the water would have split. The whole world was aware of what had taken place. So the clear car says, Vahalo nisi mitzrayim hayu gedoli me'elu, Valama lo hit bonem ba'otan gedolos v'norois ha'shiros ha'shem. The miracles that took place in Egypt, including the splitting of the sea on the way out, were much greater than whatever just took place in that war with Sichon and Og. So why weren't they considering those, meaning the, the Moabites, the, the, the nations that were here, whether it's even Midian, but at least the Moabites, they were not considering what took place 39 years prior? This is what's agitating them? This is what's frightening them? So the Kliyakar basically sums up that first paragraph delineating each one of the four different terms used to describe Israel or seemingly the Jewish people and he ends by saying hello Davarhu this is extremely unusual this never happens so let's begin with the next paragraph where he begins to explain and it's a long explanation so I beg you to bear with us Ubiur Hadavar Kahu the explanation of the matter is as follows the way the world works that the kings were always literate or they had people that could tell them what was in their chronicles the history books they had a, such libraries which would describe in writ in a written fashion all of history but when it came to the Ignorant masses. The only thing they knew was the present, whatever was going on. How much tomatoes cost today at the Shuk? What they actually saw with their own eyes. Or what they heard, whether by rumor or town crier, right? Remember those days when someone come to town and read a big letter? Right, they would read the news. Most people were illiterate, and it's only what they heard. Min hamoraot shibimayam of whatever occurred in their days. Therefore, Balach lefikak Balach hayamelech, who happened to be a king, he named Yamim Rabim Yipakedetzlo. All of history, or at least the main parts of history, was known to him. Etzlo was by him. Masha also Yaakov. He knew what Jacob. Our forefather, who, by the way, is called Yisrael Saba, okay? He's Israel, our great, 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 I'm not going to say it, on and on and on, great-grandfather, right? He was the, uh, the patriarch, and he knew what happened to us. He knew what Yaakov did to the Amorites. So what did Yaakov do to the Amorites? I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey. We go to, on the, English, on the English, English source sheet, number four, in Genesis chapter 48. It's really verse 22, but if you go to 21, this is what Israel, known as Yaakov, said to Yosef. He said, behold, I'm going to die, and God will be with you. And he will return you back to the land of your forefathers, and I have given you, what does this mean, one portion above, above, over and above your brothers, because Yosef really was the firstborn of his favorite right wife, Rachel. Okay? So f even though Ruvain was, the f was really the firstborn, Ruvain lost that status to a certain extent. And he chose um, at this point to tell Yosef that his two sons, Menashe and Ephraim, are being elevated to the status of tribes, basically. And they will each receive a portion. So you're going to receive one portion over your brothers, but then this is the kicker, which I took from the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. Now he actually is giving them Shechem. It's in part of Ephraim. In Hebrew, it's Shechem Echad. So the word for a portion 
is also Shechem, and he is giving them the land of Shechem as well. So that's one way to read it, that I'm giving you Shechem, but it is one portion over and above, and he says, which I took from the hand of the Amorites. So in other words, so that even though God promised the land of Israel, we didn't really settle in the land of Israel at that time, so we didn't settle Shechem. So, but Yaakov is taking credit, and I want you to be aware of this, these are his words, not mine, that he's taking credit for this war, or the wiping out of an entire nation um, in Shechem, with his own sword and with his own bow, as the Hebrew says, Asher l'kakti miyada emori b'charbi u'bekashti. Now we should all have a problem with this because Yaakov was not happy about the fact that Shimon and Levi went ahead and wiped out an entire nation without consulting him, without, uh, right? So there is a Rashi here I want you to look at in, in number four on that verse, Genesis 48, 22. At the very bottom, it says, which I took from the hand of the Amorite, from the hand of Esau. Now come on. How did Rashi come up with that? Esau was not an Amorite. So Rashi goes on and explains, and it's based on the Midrash, because Esau acted like, he behaved like an Amorite. Now there's another explanation of why Esau is called Amuri, because he deceived his father with his, the sayings of his mouth. But also, what does it mean by my sword and my bow? with his cleverness and with his prayer. Now, it says in the Hebrew, he chachmato utfilato. So I want to interpret chachmato, his cleverness, more as his Torah learning, and tefilato as his prayer. And we're going to discuss this a little bit more in depth because it's very interesting so far, I hope. So, so far, what did we see that, as the Kleokar says, that Yaakov, our great-grandpappy, he's the one who t is taking credit, uh, at least in, in the history books. And he was only one man with a few sons, right? He had 12 sons. Not all of them were at, maybe even participated, but it was a small clan. Kihu Hayaraki Echad, he was just like a single guy. Ubine Beto Mate Mispar. And his household was very few. And nevertheless, nevertheless, he conquered an entire people. And we just read the verse in Genesis 48, 22, where he says, and taking credit for such a thing. Now, according to Chazal, in Gomorrah Baba Basra, page 123a, the uh, Chazal say over there, what does it mean, Bacharbi u Bekashti, with my bow? I'm sorry, with my sword and my bow. The Gemara over there says, Bitfilato. Uh, now it's true, it says that, but it actually, it actually divides it. There's two types of prayer. We'll call it Justam prayer and Bekashot. And we're going to actually discuss what's the difference between prayer which is usually, and we'll talk about it being shvach, praises, versus bekashot, which is requests for needs. And I want to go into, I do believe I have it here, I think on page four, a very interesting ben Yehoda, ben Yehoyada, in the ben Ishchai. So I hope we will spend some time on that. I think it's very interesting. In the meantime, this all comes out well according to the Kleokar because he's going to explain what did Balak see? Sherob Balak, kol asher also Yishal Saba le'emori betfilato that Balak saw in with his own eyes in these history books. What Yaakov did as the Gemara explains, his sword and his bow is through his prayer. Where is the power, the might of the Jew and anybody who joins up in his mouth? And I'm going to just delineate through learning Torah is with your mouth and prayer is with your mouth. Al Cain, therefore, what did Balak try to do? He. he Al Kain Hishtadelhu 
גם כן אחר אחד שגם כן כוכב בפיו. Therefore, what did he do? He made every effort to find somebody, an individual somewhere, who also had some kind of, I don't know what to call it, the gift of the gab, something where the power was in his mouth. And this is none other than Bilam the sorcerer. Well, and now we understand why it says in the very beginning of our verse that Balak saw. Not necessarily what he saw was what, the, uh, what we did to Sichon and Og, which had just taken place. That may be true. We're not saying that's not true. That may be pshat. But there's a deeper meaning that he actually saw these history books that describe the power of the Jew, the power of Yaakov, the power of Israel Saba that he has the power of the mouth, and therefore he sought out a sorcerer to counteract that power. And the clear card goes on and explains, and that's why the verse does not say, Balak, that Balak heard. You think Balak was standing right on the edge of the mountains with binoculars watching what was happening? Maybe. But he could have heard it. But the, the Torah goes out of its way to say that he saw. And what did he saw? He saw... What did he see? He saw all that was written, all that took place in the history books. Ki kol hakaros ahem, halohem ketuvim al sifrei divrei yamim lamalche adama. Wasn't it written in the books, these history books that the kings had? V'ra be'enav hadavar, ketuv al sefer. He saw with his very own eyes what was written in the book. V'nichnas moirech bilvavo lemor. And therefore, he was overcome with a certain type of a fright, a cowardliness, a demoralization. And he says, my gosh, im came. If that's the case, osu bishanim kadmonios, if what took place, I'm going to guess around 200, 250 years prior, maybe th almost 300 years prior, let's just say 250 years prior to this, uh, the Jewish people coming in, Israel coming into the land of Israel. So what he said, wow, if that happened with such a small number, biyota mase mispar, while they were just few in number, mayasu ota biyotam am ravatsum. What do you think they're going to do now when they are so many and so strong? Now we understand why four different descriptions are being used, and this one was being used by Yisrael, meaning Yisrael Saba, and not B'nai Yisrael, not the word Ha'am for people, and not the word Kahal for congregation. It was because it was Israel Saba that the verse is referring to when it says that he saw. Actually, now I think it's appropriate to just take a short break from the clear car and see what the Ben Ishchai, the Ben Yehoyada on Baba Batra 123a is telling us because he's, it's based on the Gomorrah. The Gomorrah said that the, 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 the sword is tefillah and the bow is referring to requests. So, charbi zu tefillah kashti zebekasha. Now, yesh lomar, there is to say, ma hefresh yesh ben tefillah lebakasha. What exactly is the difference between prayer and requests? Lam le tefillah mechana b'shem cherev u bekasha b'shem keshet. And why would there be this, like, I'm not going to call it a nickname, but some kind of a, a name used to describe or the, the cherev, the sword, is somehow being used to, in, 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 um, to give over the idea of tefillah, and the, the, um, the bow is somehow being um, used in terms of requests. I think you can e easily see the word bakasha and the word keshet. Obviously, there's a relationship right away, and he will discuss that idea. Um, so near Ali, it seems to me, with the help of God to explain, that tefillah is koi al devarim shmispale la adam litzarek gavoa. When we use the word, we're, when we use the term tefillah, 
This is something that a person does in order to serve God. Okay? To serve God. I, I have needs to serve God, and therefore my tefillah will enhance those needs for the highest purpose. Shutikun olomos. That somehow I need to fix the world or the worlds. So, the kol tefillah shutzarek tikun olamois that all the tefillah is there, all the prayers are there in order to fix the worlds. Shiebo sidarim keneged atzelus bria yitzira and asiya. That and the world is organized according to these four levels. I will call it emanation, creation, formation, and action. Now I want to make one little stop here and a caveat. We, and I will put the link below. So we had, we, were, we merited, we were zochet to have Rabbi Josh Golden, who wrote a book on the name of God and how to use it in prayer. And he goes through different chazal and, the, the, and probably the, the, um, the Kabbalistic svarim that explain how each letter of the yud in the hay and the vav in the hay parallel to so many different levels, but one of them is the prayer and we do like this, the brachas and the korbanos in the morning relate to the first, and actually it's the other way around, it starts with the hey, yud hey vav hey, in an opposite direction, but it, bring us, it brings us to the highest level. The korbanos is one of the letters of God's name, the zmiros, meaning pesukah de zimra, the psalms we say in preparation for Shema and prayer, and then yotzer, or that's the bracha for the, for the Shema, which is another letter, and then the Amida, which would be the, the smallest yud of Atsilus of reaching the highest level of emanation. So he mentions this is Keneged Dalit Alomos, the Atsilus, the Bria, and the Yitzira, and the Yitzira, reaching those, and they are parallel, those four levels. So I, again, I will put the description, I will put the link in the description box below. I encourage everyone to watch that video. And he says like this, she, this is from the Zohar, Shehem Keneged Dalad Osios, they're parallel to the four, I mean those four levels of creation are parallel to the four letters of the UK Vavke, Baruch Hu, blessed be his name, Haromez Becherev, which actually is hinted at in the sword itself, Kemosh Shechatu Bezohar HaKodesh, like it's written in the Zohar, the Holy Zohar. It says the Yud of the Yud Kevavke is like the tip of the sword. Yud Reisha Decherba. And the Os Vav, the Vav, which is the straight long line, is the, the, the sword itself. Gufa Decherba. That's the sword itself. And then you have two He's, right? The second letter and the last letter. The Shnei Heim, Treim Panim, El Echerev, Mikano Mikan. The two hays somehow represent the two sides or two edges of the sword. I think it means the two sides. Therefore, actually, listen to these two verses. There are verses that talk about God's sword, the Yud Kevavke, the sword of Yud Kevavke. I want you to go into Judges 7.20. Right? By the way, we're on page 4 on the English source sheet. I think it's 10 and 11. So it says over there, in Judges 7, oh, it's 9 and 10. Uh, at the very end, by Gidon and the sword, let's read the whole verse. And the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers, and they held the torches in their left hands, and in their right hand the trumpets to blow, and they cried. They're going out to war. We're going to win. The sword for the Lord and for Gidon. Cherev Lashem. It's a sword for God, meaning the sword itself is representative in the Yud Kevavke itself. And in Jeremiah 47, verse 6, uh, the, so, the sword of the Lord, how long will you not be silent? In Hebrew, Hoi Cherev Lashem. Again, be, prepare yourself for prayer and for war. Keep in mind, this is, very, this is a very um, fundamental aspect and point that we're about to talk about. And we have, we are talking about. So, the the um, the Ben Yehuda continues and says, therefore, the tefillah is for the needs of fixing the four worlds. We already discussed what they are: the Yitzelas, the Bria, Yitzir, and Asiya, that are parallel to the four letters of God's name, which is hinted at in the sword. 
And that's why, and it's hinted at by the name sword. Fine. However, when it comes to requests, because what was the original question? What is the difference between prayer and requests? When it comes to requests, those are the Shele Tzarkav Shel Adam. Shehem Tzarek Lom Hazeh. That is for the needs of a man in this world. Dimo to Lekeshet. This is similar to the Keshet. The Keshet, by the way, is like a rainbow. Why does the rainbow face this way? Right? I hope you're all looking at me. It goes like this. Because the truth is, the arrow is going to shoot straight up. Right? This is your needs. You're actually praying. Right? That's why the, the, uh, the symbol of the rainbow is going straight up. Um, so anyway, he says that the, 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 the rainbow, which is a keshet, is half of a circle. And so too, this world we call Olam Hazeh was created with the letter He, and He is half of the Yud, half, half of ten. He is five. So this world was created with He, which is half of the Yud, which the world to the, the, the world to come was created with the Yud. I want to stop here and discuss verse um, Isaiah twenty six four. Look at number eleven on page four. Trust in the Lord forever, for in Yah the Lord is the rock of eternity. Now that is a translation. It's not the only translation. Look at the Hebrew. Ki biyah, meaning in the Yud and the He, Hashem, Yud Ke Vav Ke, created or formed the worlds. It's through the Yud and the He of God's name, that's Yud for the world to come, and the He for the Olam Hazer. By the way, just to look at the name Ish and Isha. Okay? The Ish, it's Aleph Yud Shin. I think I have this on number 12, by the way. And I know this is very contentious to talk about nowadays. But we'll call it, the Ish is a male, masculine, right? The man. And that is the Yud. Look at the letter. It's Aleph Yud Shin. So there's a Yud there. As opposed to a woman, which is an isha, it's the same aleph shin, but it has a hay. The hay represents the feminine, the the the, uh, the female, the woman. There are such things, right, as men and women. Okay, I don't want to get off on any side points here. Now, the Ben Yehuda goes on to explain that he already discussed this idea uh, somewhere else in Perkei Avot. See, in Perkei Avot. You'll see that number 13. Ethics of our fathers, it's uh, chapter 1, Mishnah 3. Antigonos of Socha received the tradition from Shimon the Righteous, and he would say, don't be as slaves who serve their master for the sake of reward. But rather be as slaves who serve their master not for the sake of reward. And that's uh, Ella, and really the fear of heaven should be upon you. You So what is the, what is the uh, Ben Yehoyada trying to say? That what we should be involved in, right? We should be looking for the pras in the world to come. Not looking for the world. The, the, it's interesting, the word pras in Hebrew is very similar to the English word prize. Correct? Okay? So the reward, you should be looking for the reward in the world to come, not this world. Hainu mazeh, right? Don't be looking for the reward in this world. Shupra shinivra bechetzios shinivra ba'olamaba. That that prize, that reward was created with the half of the letter, which was created with, with basically it's the hey, not the yud. It's only half of the letter Yud. It's about this world. Lachem Bakasha, therefore, the, what we do when we make requests, and this is interesting, that the requests are for needs of this world, <coughs> which are Mechuna Oysu B'Shem Keshet. That's why the Bakashot are referred to the Keshet, because it is a, it's, the, um, it's like the letter He. Now, what is a Tzaddik? We all want to be Tzaddikim, we want to be righteous. So what does a tzaddik do? He's oisei chayel. 
it's the righteous people who are successful, who somehow or another have the ability and strength, like there are malachim, kolom or malachim. Gam min hadiburim asher yevakesh besug bekasha shehid letzarek olamazeh. But you know what? Those things which a person needs and makes the request are usually for this world. Now he goes, Yan ki betzarche olam hazeh, gam ken kavvan l'shem shemayim, just like it said in Perki Avot, that yes, sometimes you do have needs in this world, but the, we're here to elevate this world. And that's why you have to get married, or you should try, right? Through, through, through marriage, you, you're bringing together the male and the female that can really be utilized to elevate this world into the, uh, the world in the higher realms to become transcendental. You want to be transcendental? Just find your mate. Work on trying to find your mate. That what we're here to do is elevate this world. Therefore, when, um, when Yaakov took responsibility for taking whatever it was he took from the Amorites, it was Bechayel Asher Asiti. Right? With the success in which I have done, it's because of my prayers and my requests. With my sword, which is my prayers, and with my requests. In other words, he took, he, if, if the prayers already represent whatever it is he's trying to accomplish in the world to come, that's already t taken care of. But also the bakashot, all that I need in this world, I am using, hopefully, I'm praying for that that I could use them to elevate this world. Okay, so let's go back into the, uh, the Kleokon. Okay, Aval Moab, what about the Hamonam? What about the masses of these Moabites? The Hainu Klal Hamonam. This was the, uh, the general population. Lohit Bonem Bimash Avar. They were not considering or considered of the past Kilo yodu mahu. They were not even knowledgeable about what the past. Velo pachadu. Therefore, they had no fear. Ki imena hoiva. The only thing they feared was the present uh, moment. Masharobe nehem am ravatsum. The only thing they feared was what they saw in their own eyes in front of them. And what was that? The verse says it. Because it was numerous. Moab became very frightened of the people because it was numerous. Hayahamon am shel Moab yireim ibnei shtei There were two groups in the desert. It wasn't just one group. There were the nat naturally born Israelites from the 12, tri 12 uh, sons of Jacob and 12 tribes. And then you had a group called the Erev Rav. The heir of Rav was the mixed multitude that, believe it or not, Moses on his own decided to bring them out because he saw potential. He must have seen potential in them because, believe me, they were troublemakers, yet there was a lot of potential. So that's why the verse says, the Yagar Moab, Mipnei Ha'am, that Moab became very frightened because of the people Ha'am Remember one of the questions, the first, one of the first questions, how come there are four descriptions, four names for the Jewish people? And this Ha'am was very numerous. Ha'am, Shel Moab, Yerim, and Eshtek, you find. Velori, Zek, and these two groups were not like each other. Ki Mimpnei Ha'erev Rav, Ha'yurayim, Machmas, Ribuyim. And the reason they were afraid of the Moab, of the Erev Rav, the mixed multitude, is because they were many. Now it's brought down in the Michilta, number 14, that it says, there are three different opinions, how big the Erev Rav was. I don't know if there's any other opinions besides this about how big. But if Rabbi Yishmael says they were double what we were. So if we were 3 million, that means there were 6 million of them. Actually says there was 1,200,000, meaning there was twice the amount of 600,000. That's what um, he says. May of the Esrim Reboy, Divari Rishmael. Okay, 120 ten thousands. One million two. We say, right, the Torah tells us there were 600,000 Jews. They were twice what we were. Rabbi Akiva holds twice that, 2,400,000. And Rabbi Natan held, held 3,600,000. 
Either way you look at it, they were greater in number than we were. Okay? So if Moab is looking at the Jewish people, which in the desert, so the Israelites were all together in a certain formation surrounding the Mishkan, and then around them was a whole other group that was quite separate to a certain extent, and that was the Erev Rav. So he says like this, She'erev Rav hayashte pa'amim shishim ribo, that the Erev Rav was at least twice the amount that there were Jews. So regarding them, now we understand when it says that Moab grew very frightened because of the people, who are the people? The word ha'am is a code in the Torah for the Erev Rav or for the more inferior evil amongst the Jews. Okay? So it says, Kara ha'erev Rav b'shem ha'am, that the way the Erev Rav is always called, they're always called the people. Kilobim ne'eshrohem, because they're not from the children of Jacob. They're not part of, well, at least then. The truth is, they converted at Sinai, and they did become, and you're allowed to marry, because we don't know who they are, you are allowed to marry them. Basically Jews today. Ki rav hu, because they were many. Ki rabim heima bemes. They really were more than the Jews anyway. They were quite a lot of people. Aval ben when it came to the Jewish people. Shelo hayu kolkak rabim. We weren't as many as the Erev rav. Lo yoru mehem mitzad riboim. So they weren't afraid from us, the, the, the Israelites, because of the multitudes. Amna mitzad acher hayamari Yisraelim. But it was from a different reason that they were afraid of us. Asher olav nemar. Now this gets a little hairy. It says in our parsha, the yokats Moab. Moab became, again, they translate as disgusted. Mipne, because of, or an account of the Jewish people. The word kotz, the, the root of this word, is like a thorn, right? When you have a thorn, it's just very bothersome. It, it, you want to get rid of that thorn. But we're going to read it a little differently. Weeds. Weeds. Thorns and thistles are weeds, okay? What does that mean? We're going to go back on a journey, back to the land of Egypt, where they were disgusted because we were multiplying greatly and they had to come up with a plan to even uh, cause more slavery and more hardship on us so that we wouldn't multiply, right? So if we were working so hard, we would come home from a, a long day at work, uh, right? And not be interested in procreation, right? So let's listen to the verses here. We just said by Moab they were viyakats, Look over there in Parsha Shmos. That's Exodus chapter 1, verse 12. Look at number 15 on the source sheet. But as much as they would afflict them, so did they multiply and so did they gain strength. And they were disgusted because of the children of Israel. Now what does that mean? The Egyptians were disgusted? It's the exact same words. V'yakutsu mipnei b'nei Israel. They became whatever this word is on account of the Jewish people, Rashi tells us they were disgusted with their own lives. Some explain at that point they were disgusted with themselves. Okay, so what the clear card will then do is actually prove that in their own eyes, similar to when we came into Israel and we said we're grasshoppers in their eyes, so too the Egyptians were felt truly inferior to us as if they were what? As if they were weeds to be uprooted. And if we go with that, and you'll see that's the example that the Kleokar expresses, so too the Moabites felt that they too were going to be weeds that were going to be uprooted to plant or replant or enroot the Jewish people who were compared to a grapevine. Not just any grapevine, but a grapevine that is going to be uprooted from the land of Egypt to be replanted in the land of Israel. And as everyone knows, a farmer must get rid of the weeds before you go and plant your very nice crop. So let's go into the Kleokar, and where he says like this, regarding Parshat Shmot, it says by the Egyptians, Vayakutsu mipne b'nei Israel. They were, again, disgusted, or whatever Vayakutsu means, on account of the Jewish people. 
And, and, and the clear car says, it's not like Rashi explains, Shana Perush Yisrael Nasu Kekoitzim Beinam, as the, the, the end of that Rashi says, our, our rabbis, however, it interpreted to mean that they, the Israelites, were like thorns in their eyes. It's true, there is a Gemara that says that, but the clear car wants to go a step deeper. The Imkem Havile Lememar, because if that was true, the clear car claims, it would have said, Vayakutsu Bine Yisrael, not Mipne Bine Yisrael. It says on account of, or in front of, or because of. So he wants to say the opposite is true. Ela Ithcha Mistabra. The entire opposite is true. That the Mitzrim Himshalu et Atzmam Lekoitzim. Do you understand? It was that the Egyptians themselves felt or compared themselves to weeds in relationship or in value. Be'erech B'nei Yisrael Shenimshalu Legefen. How do we know that the Jewish people are compared to a luscious, fruitful vine? Look in Psalms, in number 16. Psalms chapter 80, verse 9 and 10. King David says to Hashem, You uprooted a vine from Egypt. Gethin mi Mitzrayim tassiah. And on the way, you drove out the nations and planted it. You mamish got rid of them. To garish goyim v'titoyah. And then you cleared a place before it. Again, you're getting rid of all of the, all of the weeds. Panita lifaneha. You mamish opened up the area. You cleaned it out. Vitashresh shorasheha. In order for it to take root. Vitamale aretz. And even Rashi says there that um, basically the Jewish people are compared to this, um, this vineyard. Afterwards, you drove out the seven nations and planted Israel in their land. When it says you cleared out before it, it means those who were dwelling there. So you got rid of the shaft, you got rid of the weeds. Now how does the Kleokar know this? He's going back to Egypt, because remember the same words were used over there. And he's going to explain exactly, as we know there's a tradition in Chazal, that this is how the Egyptians saw themselves, as weeds going to be replaced by this fruitful vine called Israel. So after we just read Psalms chapter 80, verse 9 and 10, the Kleokar says, this is how the world works. How does the world work? That when the owner of the field desires, he wants to plant a vineyard. However, the field is full of weeds. He must get rid of, uproot those weeds, min hasharish, from the roots themselves. Umashlicha zare vahola and get rid of them, just throw them outside of the fence. Kedelita bimakoma magefin in order to plant in its place the, the fruitful vine. Kachayu mitzrim yireim. This is how the Egyptians feared or saw themselves. Shisra hayu natuim beretz kegefin that they saw them becoming so numerous. And they felt they were, they saw them as being planted in the land of Egypt like a fruitful vine. Vehema olu min aretz. So interesting. What does it mean, va'olu min aretz? So if you just take a look real quick at, at Exodus chapter 1, verse 10, um, it's number 17, at the very end of that verse. So this is what Pharaoh said to his people. Behold, the people of the children of Israel more numerous and stronger than we are. Get ready. Let us deal very shrewdly with them, lest they increase and war befall us. They join our enemies, wage a war against us. And what is the next few words? And depart from the land. Now, from reading it, and Rashi will say it, Pashat Pshat means they're going to leave. There are possessions. We don't necessarily want them to leave. There, there are economic base. I mean, if we own them, they're valuable, and they're doing valuable work. So that would affect us negatively if they depart from the land. However, however, and we'll see Rashi actually says like this, and like the clear car is going to base his opinion on Rashi to a certain extent, that no, they're going to become so numerous and become enrooted as this fruitful vine 
we are going to be kicked out. So in Exodus chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, he said to his people, Behold, the, children, the, the people of the children of Israel are more numerous and stronger than we are. Get ready, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they increase and a war befall us, and they join our enemies and wage a war against us, the Olamin arts, and go up from the land. You might think the Pashup shot is that they are going to leave and we're going to lose our possession. But Rashi says that our rabbis, however interpreted as depicted by Pharaoh, as a person who actually is cursing himself. In other words, when a person feels that he's cursed, but he'll ascribe the curse to others. Nobody wants to curse themselves, so you'll somehow make sure that whatever negativity may be coming on you is somehow deflected and pushed on the others. As it is written, as, and it is, as if it's written here, we will depart the, from the land, and they will take possession from it. Meaning, as if. It doesn't really say that. It just simply says in very vague terms, they will depart, or someone will depart. Something is going to go up from the land, which leaves the interpretation to be probably them. I'm not going to say me. And that's why the clear card right away says, he says over there, um, well, it's right after that, but I'm skipping one verse for a second, because I actually didn't even bring it in. There is a verse in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 6, that mentions kakots munad kulaham, which means godless men are like wind-blown thistle. Okay, that's just a side point, but in our verse, which we just read in Shmos chapter 1, verse 10, the, the Kliakar is quoting from the Gemara. The Alinu, remember, they're the ones speaking, right? It's the Egyptians speaking. We would go up, but instead of saying we would go up, let's put the curse on them that they should go up or leave it open and vague. 100% right, I am 100%. No, Seder, Seder, Seder. Okay, so that's pretty much, if you look in 18, uh, Gemara Sota uh, 11a very much describes that idea. Rabbi Rab Ava Bar Kahana said, by stating this, Pharaoh is like a person who curses himself, but he doesn't want to do that, so he instead applies the curse to another. So that's why he left it more vague with anybody interpreting it as the Jews would go up, but really the, the fear is that he would go up, meaning that he has to realize he's the inferior. I mean, that's how he really feels about himself, as if he would be thrown out of the land of Egypt. The, look, at, look at the continuation of the Kliakar. Vayukutsu mipne b'nei Yisrael. This is the verse used by the Egyptians. Sheheme yinaru min aretz mipne b'nei Yisrael shenim shulegethen. That they, the Egyptians, would be thrown out or shaken out of the land on account of the Jews who would be so enrooted <coughs> because they're compared to this luscious fruit. That's why now it says over in our Parsha by Moab, Vayakats Moab. The Moab was, again, disgusted or felt like weeds because on account of or in comparison to the Jewish people. Shayu Yireim, that's what they were afraid of. Penye Moab, Kakots, Mushlak, Minaretz. That they felt maybe they were like weeds that were going to be discarded, uh, thrown out from the land on account of the Jewish people who are the Geffen, who are that luscious fruit, Asher Hisi Hashem Mitzrayim, that Hashem uprooted from Egypt, Legaresh Mipneim Goyim, in order to expel the nations that were here, Ulanatam Shama, and to plant the Jewish people in their place. That's why it says, B'nai Israel. remember we have four names, four names of Jewish people, and the, the Yokots, Mipnei B'nai Israel. all right, Moab, Mipnei B'nai Israel, because it's the B'nai Israel that they were afraid of. Um, it doesn't say Yisrael, it says B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, because Yisrael is no longer around. Ki halach lo he's already in the, the net, the, he's already in the, the world to come. And his children are the one coming in. B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, the one entering the land. Avaloa, Erev Rav. Of course the Erev Rav are coming in. But the Erev Rav are 
like, I, I don't want to use such a negative term, but like almost like a parasite, right? Almost, they were just clinging on to the Jewish people. They came in Agav. The only merit they had was that they wanted to j join the Jewish people to whatever extent they wanted to join. We're not even sure. It could be they just wanted to leave Egypt. It's a little bit shady, but they definitely had potential. And that's why they're called by the word Ha'am. Ha'am is always that negative, the people uh, who are always be causing trouble. Kima gavar meguvrim uma yitron le'erav al sharu umos. What exactly is the benefit, advantage that the erav had over the other, you know, seventy nations that existed? Shigaresh mivneim goyim that God ended up removing, you know, the seven uh, nations v'yita osam b'mekomam and planting even the erav in its place in the land of Israel. Im lo aga b'nei Israel. It was only on account of the Jewish people. Very strong statement. Okay, we're in for the last paragraph. That's why it says the Yomer Moab el Zikne Midian. I know Larry raised this idea in the beginning, and here we're going to address it. That the elder, that the the Moabites went to the elders of Midian and told them, Oto yilachachu hakaal. Now the the uh, congregation is licking up our surroundings. Why? What are they trying to do? They're trying to gain an ally. And what is their, um, you know, what's the hitch here? What, how can they draw in the, the Midianites? So that's where we're going to start. Maro Midianim al Aber al Riv lo lehem. Why would they be enticed to join a fight that's not theirs? What could the Moabites possibly convince them that will, um, you know, that they'll conceive? Yeah, yeah, sure. We'll fight a war that's not ours. Ella Lathisha Metzina Shapirish Rashi. If we go to chapter 31 in Numbers, in Parshas Pinchas, I believe, in um, 31.6. Go to number 19. So Moses sent them to fight. And who did, he fight, who did he send? It says he sent along with the Jewish army, along with each tribe, a thousand from each tribe, he sent along Pinchas. Now Pinchas is true. He's a, he's a Kohen, and he probably served in a very special role. It's called the Kohen Mashiach, the anointed Kohen who serves as the head of the war. But nevertheless, that Rashi tells us that <coughs> there's this long machlokus. Who exactly is the Putiel that um, Pinchas' mother descended from? So there's two different opinions. And I, I, I want to say the Kleokar resolves it somewhere else. He says it's not two different opinions. Remember, you have four grandparents. Everyone has four grandparents. So... Uh, Pinchas' mother is Eliezer's wife, and Eliezer's wife is the daughter of Pituel. Pituel and Pituel, there's, you'll see there's two different opinions. If you look in that Rashi on um, Numbers 31.6, it clearly says that it means the descendants of Jethro and the descendants of Yosef. So it's not a Machlokas. The clear car proves that. What Rashi is saying is true. It's not that it's one or the other, but there's um, from the, the mother's father or the mother's mother and where the, she came from. That it's true that... So basically what we're concluding here is Pinchas was sent to take vengeance on what? On the fact that Yosef, Yosef was sold by the Midianites. In other words... Let's go quickly to verse uh, in Genesis 37, 36. It says, And the Midianites sold him to Egypt, to Potiphar. Okay? Ul Midyani Mokru so El Mitzrayim Le Potiphar. Okay? And you can even look, if you want, on Baba Basra 109b. It goes through the whole idea as well that it's also coming from Yosef. There's an opinion, right? Yosef is the eventual, um, he's P Putiel as well. Okay, so let's finish up in the clear car. 
And now that we have established that Pinchas was sent to fight the Midianites because Shaholech Linkom Niknas Yosef Avi Imo, that he went to take vengeance for the vengeance of Yosef, that he went to take vengeance for the vengeance of Yosef, which was his maternal grandfather. As it says in the verse we just read in, in Genesis 37 36, that the Midianites were the ones that sold Yosef into Egypt. And what else do we know about B'nai Yosef? They're called Kahal. Remember the fourth term used for the Jewish people in the desert in this time, in these verses, they're called a congregation. So it says in Genesis 35, 11, you can find that on uh, number 24, right? When, is that right? In 35, 11, God said to him, I am the Almighty God, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a multitude of nations shall come into existence from you. And this is referring to Menashe and Ephraim. Look three lines down in the Rashi when it says a nation, a goy, goyim, nations, Menashe and Ephraim. So the single nation is Benjamin. And that's also through Rachel, but Menashe and Ephraim through Yosef. Who were, destined to, who were destined to emanate from Yosef. And, of course, they were counted in with, uh, into the, uh, the level of the tribes. So that's what Kahal is referring to, Menashe and Ephraim, meaning Yosef. V'chein Amar Moab el Zikne Midian. So what were the elders of Moab saying to the, sorry, what, were the, what was the Moabites saying to the elders of Midian? Shagam atem yesh lechem liyero mipnei kahal. That you guys, right, I want you to be my allies. I'm Moab and I'm talking to you, the Midianites. You have what to fear because of the kahal, the children of Yosef. Sheyirtzu likach michem niknas Yosef bechor shor avihem. That they, right, that they're going to want to take out vengeance on you because of what you did to Yosef, who's called the Bechor Shor, the firstborn ox. Okay, now I want to, I want to finish this paragraph because one more line, and I want to go back into a little bit of a hint about the golden calf. And this is what it says in our Parsha. Right now, the, uh, this kahal, this congregation is going to lick up all of their surroundings like the way a, an ox licks up because it's the kahal, the B'nai Yosef, which is called a Bechor Shor. Therefore, Yilachachu Otanu, they're going to lick us up. They're going to wipe us out like a shore licks up. Kedei likak nikmas ashor in order to take out the vengeance on the ox. And this is a perish car. I just want to mention, I was always bothered by what does it mean by this golden calf? The Erevra were basically responsible. In other words, they, if, if Aaron collected the gold and threw it into a fire and it came out as a calf, and then these people who instigated the whole thing basically turned around and said, these are your gods of Israel who took you out of the land of Egypt. Who would ever imagine? Everyone knew that God did it with the ten plagues and the splitting of the sea. What bothers me. What bothers me is that everybody knows this thing wasn't around. It was just created right now. So they're going to say, this is your God's original that took you out of the land of Egypt. Uh, who would buy into that, that thing? I mean, that's, you know, these new religions, you know, whether it's Christianity or there's like some new, new invention... Uh, something our own fathers didn't know. I mean, we're, we're taught over and over again. Don't fall for anything that you weren't taught or knew of previously. So how is it all of a sudden these people are coming and saying, these are your gods of Israel who took you out of the land of Egypt. It was God himself, or at least Moses had a major part of it. But this cow was not around. So I want to say like this. This is um, a very interesting idea. Rashi, on that verse, in uh, Exodus 32, verse 4, where it says, These are your gods, O Israel. It's number 25 on the source sheet. Who brought you up from the land of Egypt. At the very bottom, well, it says, These are your gods. But it doesn't say, These are our gods. So this is one of the proofs that it was the Erev Rav. Because if it was Jews that said it, they would have said, This is our God. 
but these are outsiders saying these are your gods, right? And he, the Rashi says, from here we learn it was the mixed multitude who had come up from Egypt were the ones who gathered against Aaron, and they were the ones who made the calf. So what does it mean they, they made the calf? If we say that Aaron threw the gold in to the fire and it came out, it was because they had something on their mind. I'm not sure, I'm not going to say it's sorcery per se, but what we think ends up becoming reality, whether it's on the positive side or the negative side. That's why we should always be thinking in Torah and positive thoughts. So I want to say like this. When we, we, the Jewish people, the Israelites, on the, ten, the night of the, the, the firstborn were being wiped out, we went around asking our neighbors for gold. That's where the gold comes in. What was Moses busy with? Moses was fulfilling a promise to Yosef. Yosef made his brothers and his children swear. We are not going to leave without you, right? We're going to, we promise we'll take your bones up. And as Moses approaches the Nile in order to bring up the bones of Yosef, he says, Ale shor, Ale shor. Those are the words he uses, right? Um, even the, the blessings in Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 17 and number 27. It says over the, to his firstborn ox is given glory. This is a bracha to Ephraim and Asha. That's called Bechor Shoro. And even in, in Genesis 49.22, when Yaakov is blessing Yosef, a charming son is Yosef, a son charming to the eye of the women. Each one strode along to see him. In Hebrew, it's Ale Shor. There's this hint. There's some hints going on about Yosef and the Shor and this ox. And we have it right here with the kahal. So going back to what was on these people's minds, what were they thinking? We need an intermediary. We see through the satin that Moses is not just delayed, but he ain't coming back. Right? If Moses is delayed, okay, we still need an intermediary. But we need to create one now because he ain't coming back. Right? Supposedly, allegedly, whatever it means that the satin made them think that he was dead. So they created this ox? or their thought process help fundamentally create this ox that comes out of the gold on its own? Because they were thinking, we need an intermediary. Moses is no longer around, so what power, in whose merit did we leave Egypt? Moses must have known the secret. Moses went down to the Nile and brought up Yosef's bones. I mean, it's a misunderstanding on their part. You know, if you're looking for a power, and obviously all the power goes to the, the Hashem. All the glory goes to God. But if you're looking for an in, something of an intermediate, it kind of, you get a logical conclusion where they can get it from, where they could be mistaken. That you could say, we could not have left Egypt if we didn't bring his bones with us. Because he made them promise. They couldn't leave without it. Right? So in a certain sense, they're thinking, oh my God, we're all going around, or everyone's going around and getting the gold, but Moses, he's doing the holy work of bringing up Yosef's bones as if that's the great secret of our redemption from Egypt. So that's why someone has to be very careful. They have to follow the rabbis, they have to follow the Sanhedrin, whatever great body of Torah knowledge exists, and not go on your own and try to you know, make up from your own logical conclusions what you think is right. Follow the Torah, follow the instruction manual, and you'll be blessed. And that's what, what can I say? I think that's a true statement. If based on this whole conclusion of, of the Chliyakar over there with the word kahal and how it's referring to the vengeance of Yosef, because there's no doubt the Bechor Shor is referring to Yosef itself. Okay, and with that, have a great Shabbos and a great life, and we'll see you next week. Yeah, yeah, yeah.